It's The Real News. I'm Aaron Maté. President Trump has doubled down on his fire and fury threat to North Korea. Now Trump says maybe he wasn't tough enough. Frankly, uh, the people that were questioning that statement, was it too tough? Maybe it wasn't tough enough. They've been doing this to our country for a long time, for many years. And it's about time that somebody stuck up for the people of this country and for the people of other countries. So, uh, if anything, maybe that statement wasn't tough enough. And we're backed by 100 percent by our military. We're backed by everybody. And we're backed by many other leaders. And I noticed that many senators and others today came out very much in favor of what I said. But if anything, that statement may not be tough enough. Joining me is Christine Ahn, founder and international coordinator of Women Cross DMZ, a global movement of women mobilizing for peace in Korea. She is also co-founder of the Korea Policy Institute and Korea Peace Network. Christine, welcome. Thank you for having me. What's your assessment of where things are at? It's not just Trump who's talking this way. Defense Secretary James Mattis talked yesterday about the destruction of North Korea's people. Uh, meanwhile, on the other side, we have North Korea uh, threatening to turn the U.S. mainland into a theater of nuclear war. Um, talk to us about right now where things are. Things are in a really, really dangerous place. And, you know, these statements coming from across the Trump administration um, are reckless, they're dangerous, and then as you noted on the North Korean side, their rhetoric has been bombastic equally. And so you're you're having a situation where um, the rhetoric is so high, it's so loaded, um, that everybody is playing a game of chicken. And what is approaching in about a week is the US-South Korean war games that are simulating an invasion, an attack, uh, decapitation of the North Korean leadership. And so when you have this uh, state of non-communication and the only communication is bombastic rhetoric that is upping the brinkmanship on all sides, there is a high chance of miscalculation, miscommunication, misunderstanding that could lead us into a uh, potential conflict. And that would definitely engulf all the regional players potentially into a nuclear war. So I don't mean to say that to uh, raise the alarm, but I do think that we have to caution, we have to urge our uh, government leaders to use more caution. Um, today, there was a letter that was um, led by John Conyers, one of the two Korean War veterans in Congress. And um, he, you know, and, and I think 65 other members of Congress signed this letter to the Trump administration calling upon them to um, tone down their rhetoric and to engage in direct talks with North Korea without precondition. So um, I think that's the direction we need to all be calling for um, calm, as my daughter said, take a deep breath and meet with the people of North Korea. That must begin the process of an eventual peace process, because what most Americans don't realize is that the thing about the fire and fury that North Korea would never witness as the world has witnessed before, that is actually uh, completely historically inaccurate. North Korea did experience fire and fury. Um, the U.S. had threatened to use nuclear weapons, even though they used it against Japan and Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Um, but they had threatened, tr Truman threatened to use it during the Korean War. But uh, as many historians who covered that war show that it was so badly carpet bombed, 80% of North Korean cities were completely destroyed, that North Korea did experience it. And their pursuit of a nuclear weapon has very much because of that experience, of that lived experience, and recovering from that, and then witnessing what happened to both Iraq and Libya. So. Um, I think we have to understand where the North Koreans are coming from, and we have to uh, we have to recognize that they are not maniacs. They are not madmen. I mean, I think Bill Perry recently said, in fact, they're very uh, reasonable and they're very logical. And uh, even Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, when she went to North Korea to meet Kim Jong Un's father, Kim Jong Il, she said, 
this is an, a regime that we can negotiate with. And so that's where we need to bring it back to. Yeah. Christine, on the Korean War, the numbers there are uh, staggering. Uh, there's that quote from Air Force General Curtis LeMay, who said that over a period of three years or so, we killed off, what, 20 percent of the population. That's about three million people. Um, and but going to what you say there about uh, whether or not North Korea is rational, and mentioning the examples of Iraq and Libya, there was a really uh, striking statement recently from the current director of national intelligence, uh, Dan Coates, and I want to play that comment. He was speaking at the Aspen Institute about uh, what motivates the North Korean regime and its strategic thinking when it comes to nuclear weapons, and here's what he said. Our assessment has, come, uh, has uh, pretty much uh, resulted in the fact that while He's a very unusual type of person. He's not crazy. Uh, and uh, there is some rationale uh, backing his actions, which are survival. Survival for his regime, survival for his country. And he has watched, I think, uh, what has happened around the world relative to nations that possess nuclear capabilities and the leverage they have, and seen that uh, having the nuclear card in your pocket uh, 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 results in a lot of deterrence capability. The lessons that we learned out of Libya giving up its nukes and Ukraine giving up its nukes is, uh, unfortunately, if you have nukes, never give them up. If you don't have them, get them. And we see a lot of nations now thinking about how do we get them, and none more persistent uh, than North Korea. So that's Dan Coates, the uh, Director of National Intelligence, uh, speaking with candor that we don't usually hear from um, active U.S. officials. Usually it comes from former officials. So, Christine, on this front, um, can you talk about the, the impact of the experiences of places like Libya and Iraq on North Korean thinking? It's said that those factor very heavily in how the regime uh, sees the world and sees the U.S., as Coates confirms. And what has to happen now for negotiations to happen, given that they do have these nuclear weapons? What would be at stake in talks, and what would a possible resolution be? Well, I think that Bill Perry, his uh, famous quote is very apt, which is we have to deal with North Korea as they are, not as we wish it to be. And we can as much say that uh, we won't uh, acknowledge North Korea as a nuclear power. Well, they are. Um, and I think the, the question then becomes, at what stage do we want to limit their capability? And um, there is, you know, all sorts of uh, intelligence assessments about how far uh, the North Koreans can get a uh, nuclear warhead on a missile that can strike the U.S. mainland. I think that that is still uh, to remain to be confirmed. Um, but, you know, if the United States cares so much about defending um, our country, uh, then you would think that they would seriously be negotiating some kind of uh, halting of North Korean's missile. Every missile that they test is about them improving their capability. And so what we have is an intelligence community that is not on the same page about that capability. Um, and so if it's the Bush administration is saying, or sorry, the Trump administration is saying not, it's not going to happen, well, what are they actively doing by further isolating North Korea, by uh, pursuing more aggressive rhetoric and the upcoming war games that will uh, take place with South Korea? That is not going to lead North Korea to, uh, to the table to give up its nuclear weapons program. What will is some kind of diplomatic engagement the most uh, reasonable proposal that is on the table that uh, was first introduced by the North Koreans in 2015 was this freeze for freeze. North Korea would freeze its nuclear weapons and missiles um, testing and program in exchange for the U.S. and South Korea freezing its uh, joint military exercises, which have been done. They were done during the Clinton administration years. And so it's not... Uh, it's not completely out of the, the picture to, to do that. And so um, I think what needs to happen is that there needs to be dialogue. 
Christine, let me ask you about Moon Jae in because I've heard some criticism of him that despite the uh, spirit of his campaign, uh, you know, opposing the that missile system, calling for a revived sunshine policy, that he hasn't stood up enough to the U.S. since taking office. Do you think that's a fair critique of him so far? I think it's a fair critique. And I would say that uh, I think we don't, we are undermining the enormous pressure militarily, economically, politically that the U.S. wields on South Korea. Um, it, you know, Tim Sharrock, as you know, had, wrote a great chapter on, in the WikiLeaks book about what do we know about U.S. policy. I mean, you know, after No Hyun, the Obama administration, which was so-called liberal, um, but maintained still a very hawkish position with regards to Asia. I mean, it was Clinton uh, that initiated the U.S. pivot to Asia, which is about ramping up tensions um, against a rising China. You know, they they uh, see Korea as a, a, an important geostrategic point to maintain its dominance in the Asia Pacific region and. You know, the U.S., there was a funny poll that, not funny, but uh, really telling about how ignorant the Americans are. But uh, the Washington Post recently read an article about a poll that stated that uh, if the U.S., if the South Koreans were attacked by the North, that the U.S. would deploy troops. And I, my, my quick response was, we have had 30,000 troops on the Korean Peninsula since 1945. We have been there for 70 years virtually. And so, um, you know, I, I think that is very uh, emblematic of how deeply entrenched U.S. Uh, interests are in South Korea and on the Korean Peninsula. And not to mention, the U.S. has wartime operational control over South Korea. This is the 11th largest economy in the world, the 10th largest military in the world, and still it is under the thumb of the United States. That's right. And, you know, when President Trump complains about China, you know, not doing enough to pressure North Korea, the problem for China, I imagine, is that the, because there's 30,000 U.S. troops in South Korea, <laughs> they don't mind having a buffer uh, uh, in North Korea that stands uh, in between uh, them and these 30,000 troops. And certainly they don't want those troops any closer. Uh, but as we're talking about uh, U.S., um, the U.S. military presence there, let's talk about Guam, because in all this, North Korea has threatened uh, Guam. They've talked about drawing up plans to uh, attack it with uh, four missiles. Obviously, a really dire situation for that island. Can you uh, talk about uh, Guam in this context? Absolutely. And, and I would just um, maybe modify that the North Koreans are threatening. I think just as in every other statement about the U.S., about North Koreans retaliating, it has always been um, that unless the U.S., uh, you know, changes its hostile policy, that they are considering this. And um, if you look at the Korean People's Army statement about Guam, it's, uh, it's basically like it's an analysis of how B-1, B-2 bombers actually leave from Anderson Air Force Base from Guam and uh, goes to South Korea or to Japan in its, uh, in its journey towards North Korea. And so um, I think that's why the North Koreans put that focus on Guam. But what concerns me is this, uh, this brinkmanship that both sides are, are contributing to that places the people of Guam, which is the, of Guahan actually, uh, the US named it Guam, it's a territory of the United States, but the Chamorro people have been basically militarily occupied. I mean, this is an island that is called the tip of the spear for the U.S. military, uh, about 40 percent of that little island is of U.S. bases, and it's expanding as part of this U.S. pivot to Asia. And these unfortunate people are caught in this, caught in the middle of this, and um, they don't want uh, to. I mean, they're still fighting for their sovereignty from a U.S. military uh, occupation. The one member of Congress doesn't even have voting power, so. I just think it's important to bring in this kind of historical colonial legacy um, that actually ties the people of Guam to Hawaii, where I'm based, to the Philippines, to Okinawa, to uh, South Korea, 
um, that, you know, this is part of a, a long uh, history of uh, U.S. imperialism and uh, colonial occupation over the last two centuries. And, um, you know, I just think it's important that there, um, and I'm, I'm currently in the process of working on a statement with the Guahan Coalition for Peace and Justice from Women Cross DMZ and this International Women's Network Against Militarism that has been building um, a, a feminist critique, an anti-imperialist, anti-militarist critique, because what we see is that this Korean conflict is being used to justify more militarization. I mean, the day after the whole Guam thing, uh, the New York Times ran a piece about how now all the other countries, Japan and South Korea and uh, you know, everybody is amping up their military capacity and considering nuclear weapons because of the standoff that has not ended for the last 65 years. Um, and so I think we need to be challenging, you know, this brinkmanship, but also this kind of militarized mindset that says that that is going to be the solution. It's not a diplomatic solution is what's needed and for there to be a true alliance between the peoples of the countries. Um, Christine, in the last minute we have, um, I want to talk about uh, travel bans. You recently went to South Korea, and you initially were banned uh, from entering because of your peace activism there before that decision was reversed. And meanwhile, you've also spoken out against the travel ban here imposed in the U.S., where the Trump administration is now banning Americans from going to North Korea. Uh, your comments on this as we wrap. I just think it's... <laughs> We have no official contact between the United States government and the North Korean government. And now the U.S. government, now the Trump administration, is trying to deny Americans from going and meeting and understanding and speaking to the people of North Korea. That is a really dangerous precedent. Uh, we know during the, uh, the Cold War that Americans went to go meet with the Soviets, um, and that helped bring about the, the cold end of the, the, the Cold War. And during, uh, you know, the hostile uh, policy against China, that the ping pong diplomacy helped spark um, understanding between the athletes of, of uh, China and the United States. And that ultimately led to Nixon going to China and normalizing relations. So citizen diplomacy is critical. We know that the amazing activists during the Vietnam War played a critical role in bringing letters and care packages to the POWs that helped ultimately end that war. And this is a very dangerous precedent. It has never happened with regards to North Korea. And we have to challenge it. It is not a just thing. And if the government isn't going to have uh, any kind of contact with the North Korean people, we, as citizens, have a responsibility to do so. So we have to push back and, and hopefully think of creative ways to actually meet and understand the people of North Korea. Christine Ahn, founder and international coordinator of Women Cross DMZ, a global movement of women mobilizing for peace in Korea. She is also co-founder of the Korea Policy Institute and Korea Peace Network. Christine, thank you. Thank you so much, Erin. And thank you for joining us on The Real News.